Hello everyone, and this is our lecture five for the Cold War series. And uh, during this time, we're going to see the age of something called McCarthyism and the rise of President Eisenhower. Um, if you recall, we ended our last lecture with the discussion of um, one of the first hot conflicts, at least for the U.S., regarding the Cold War, and that was the Korean War. And following that, we briefly mentioned uh, the start of the new Red Scare, uh, at least as far as the federal uh, government's involvement. Now, this is a uh, picture of Senator McCarthy of Wisconsin. He's going to be known as kind of like the real leader uh, in the federal government coming from the Senate as far as trying to root out um, underground communist uh, sympathizers and agents within America. Uh, he's going to be criticized heavily throughout history as conducting witch hunts, um, looking in places and accusing people of uh, certain forms of espionage when it's not always there. However, in many cases, he was also found to be correct. So. McCarthyism. Uh, so, like I said, this is led by McCarthy. Much of the pressure to find these sympathizers was intensified also, uh, not just by McCarthy, but also people uh, like the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, and the current attorney general at the time. Um, and so there was, uh, our intelligence agencies warned us that uh, the Soviets were uh, conducting spy operations within America and that there were cells of Americans who were pro-communist and anti-government. Um, you're going to see the development of this time of the House and American Activities Committee. And this committee is going to be a, it's, it's like a lot of congressional committees. They don't have a lot of uh, power as far as charging people with crimes, so they can recommend the charging of crimes. But they can subpoena people to come testify um, uh, before them. And they can make this very public and root out a lot of information for public use. Um, they would interrogate activists, government officials, educators, and actors, and many, many more people, everyday people as well. Uh, one of their major headlines was when they had um, uh, the Screen Actors Guild president, uh, at this time he was simply an actor, Ronald Reagan, uh, testify that many of the people that he knew in Hollywood while he was an actor were communist sympathizers. And so he warned them that this was already going around and that the people who were influencing the way people thought about things through entertainment were doing so with negative intentions. Uh, of course, uh, many famous individuals were brought up, such as um, Walt Disney, who at one time claimed that many of his animators who went on strike at one point were actually communist sympathizers. So um, sometimes these accusations were legitimate and sometimes these were uh, used as tools in order to use it against people who didn't do things the way they wanted them to. So anti-communist sentiment increased in America. So this was spreading all around. It was in the papers. It was the big topic of the day. Hollywood began to build blacklists of actors, directors, producers, and other peoples in the industry who were accused of being communist, so they couldn't find work within the areas. So, like we've seen before, sometimes this was right, sometimes it wasn't right. Sometimes people were falsely accused. Um, after being exposed by F -com ex an ex-communist, uh, an ex-communist in Britain, Alger Hiss, one of the prime movers, of, I'm sorry, this ex-communist was actually uh, someone who went on to work for the papers. This ex-communist would point out um, Alger Hiss, who was uh, worked in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration during World War II, so during wartime. He also had a lot to do with FDR's negotiations with Joseph Stalin and the Soviets while he was a Soviet sympathizer. And even during the Yalta Conference, which was one of those major conferences where the Allies got together to make plans for the war and post-war. So people saw here that one of the people who was shaping the president's opinion was actually probably a communist as well. 
and it came out that he um, he gave material to communist uh, party people that was classified information on uh, microfish film, and this is like um, these are pictures that uh, that are kind of like on a roll of, for old timey photographs, right? Um, during this time, Congressman Richard Nixon is going to be rather popular because he's going to be on this uh, committee and he's going to be very good at interrogating communists and kind of showboating a little bit as well. So here we have two children reading a paper saying spies get one more day. Well, these two children are actually the children of two spies within the United States who were uh, put on the death penalty, but they were put on the death penalty because they actually gave the Russians um, the secrets, or they were part of the people who gave Russian secrets on how to build atomic weapons. So, uh, McCarthyism continued. In 1950, Congress passed uh, McCarran in Internal Security Act, requiring communists to register with the government while outlawing any attempt to plot for totalitarian governments. So, two things here. First off, if you are a card-carrying communist, if you're part of the Communist Party of America, uh, underground or otherwise, you are required by law to notify the government that you are one. Um, another thing, it also outlawed anyone who attempted to plot against the government. Now, you might say, well, that's illegal anyways. Well, this is the type of thing that gives teeth to the law. In 1951, the Supreme Court upheld a prior law called the Smith Act, ruling that membership in the Communist Party was equivalent to an act of treason in the United States. So, being a communist wasn't just illegal. The Supreme Court said, well, it's also treasonous because they are considered enemies of our nation, even though we weren't at war with them. The public was eventually shocked by the trial of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, the parents of those two children I just showed you. The British intelligence uh, had tipped Americans that the British scientist who aided in the Manhattan Project, one of them, had passed information to the Soviets. So, our scientists, along with our allies, helped create the atomic bomb. One of those scientists and some other uh, people who worked within these projects aided the Russians in having the atomic bomb. Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were put on trial as accomplices and passed atomic information onto the Soviets. This would be a big sensational trial. It would be all over the papers. Americans would be very fearful. They were already really scared that now the Russians had the atomic bomb and they were acting very aggressively in the other part of the world. They had a lot of rhetoric against the United States and they were conducting a mass amount of human rights violations. And now they found out that it was Americans illegally gave them those atomic weapons. Uh, this, this, this raised a lot of fear uh, within the country that communists could be anywhere. Now, uh, we will come back to the Red Scare, but during this time period, of course, we're going to have a change in administration. So if you remember, we had um, the Democratic Party in charge with FDR and then Truman after FDR uh, died in office. Well, now we're going to have uh, the Republican Party take charge uh, during the Cold War. And of course, here we see the picture of President Eisenhower and Vice President at this time, Richard Nixon. You might remember that Eisenhower was the lead general in charge of America's war in Europe. And uh, Nixon had made himself uh, a bit of a name as being a good anti-communist congressman. So Eisenhower, riding high on their popularity and rooting out communist sympathizers, the Republican Party was optimistic in their presidential aspirations. The Republicans chose General Eisenhower as their candidate, with Richard Nixon as the vice presidential candidate. In 1952, Eisenhower defeated uh, Stevenson the Democrat candidate, with 83% of electoral votes. Now, this has happened quite a few times in American history. Um, a very successful general, who's also popular and likable, 
uh, becomes president. Like, um, this has happened time and time again. So the guy who won the American Revolution becomes president. The guy who won the Mexican-American War becomes president. Um, the guy who won the Civil War president, now World War II president. So it happens time and time again. Um, people thought of Ike or Eisenhower as Ike as a kind of neighborly war hero who preferred to leave lawmaking to the elected officials in Congress. So people saw him as like a nice grandfather who was also kind of tough, right? As president, he relied heavily on his cabinet officials made up of various experts. Remember, cabinet are um, supposed to be advisors, but they can also be in charge of certain departments within the government. And so uh, he would use these folks uh, kind of like as a war council when he was a general. He would listen to the feedback, allow them to speak, but he always made the uh, final decision. And so it was very efficient, and it allowed information to come in, but he didn't allow his underlings to run the show. So uh, we will continue more with Eisenhower and the Cold War and in our next lecture on the Cold War. All right, thank you.